All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here for the Arkansas Native Plant Society's monthly webinar series. We're very excited today to have none other than the Arkansas Native Plant Society's president, Nate Weston, as our guest this month. This webinar is being recorded. Afterwards, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to go back and rewatch it, uh, you can do so uh, by going to YouTube and typing in Arkansas Native Plant Society to find our channel. If you'd like to learn more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society, you can do so by visiting our website at ANPS.org. Uh, joining the Native Plant Society is pretty simple. You can just go to ANPS.org slash join. Uh, where you can use your PayPal account to join right there online. You can even do that uh, before the uh, webinar is even over if, um, if you're not already a member. I'll also be placing links to the website uh, as well as how to join and our Facebook page um, into the chat here shortly uh, so you can find them there. Uh, for more details uh, about our Native Plant Society and our hikes that we have uh, meeting, we have, do have a fall meeting coming up uh, here uh, shortly within a, um, the next few, I guess, next couple months. And um, yeah, you can go to our uh, facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society or our website to find out more information about that. We're really excited to be able to resume in-person meetings. Uh, this will be our first in-person meeting that we've been able to have since the start of COVID. Uh, we do have a couple of more upcoming webinars this year uh, on Saturday, October 22nd at 6 p.m. Uh, botanist Justin Thomas is going to give us a presentation on Echesis, the nature of nature. So we're going to get into a little bit of uh, natural, uh, naturalistic kind of philosophy uh, there. You know, so we're going to go real deep. Uh, I'm really excited about that one. Uh, we'll take a break in November, but then we'll be returning in December uh, on Saturday, December 10th at 10 a.m., Karen Willard, uh, who is a botanist and a specialist for wetland plants, uh, used to manage the University of Arkansas Herbarium, and she's going to give a program for us on the Carex species of Arkansas. So uh, that whole Carex genus of sedges that's really large and, oh, it's uh, trying to get separate those things out. It's really getting into the weeds, uh, so to speak, no pun intended. Uh, but, but today we have Nate Weston. Uh, as I mentioned, he's the president of the Arkansas Native Plant Society. Uh, he is also a ge geospatial ecologist for the Beaver Watershed Alliance in Northwest Arkansas, where he's worked since 2017. Uh, Nate graduated from the University of Central Arkansas in Conway with a degree in environmental science in 2016. Uh, while he was there, he worked as a restoration assistant at the Jewel Moore Nature Reserve uh, while working on his degree. After graduating from UCA, Nate went to work under Theo Witzel at the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission as a research assistant conducting field surveys for rare plant species in Arkansas. And if you ever have had a chance to go uh, on one of Nate's many hikes that he's led over the years for the Arkansas Native Plant Society, you'll find that he is a wonderful source of knowledge on uh, the native species found here in the natural state. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nate uh, for his presentation on uh, the disturbance um, or biodiversity and disturbance um, and the role of disturbance, sorry, in managing natural ecosystems. So thank uh, Nate, thank you for very much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Eric, for inviting me. Um, I, I forget if Eric mentioned, uh, please feel free to, to raise your hand or unmute and ask me a question during the presentation. I don't mind that. It keeps me engaged, keeps my brain going. And uh, so I, I like more of a, a town hall style presentation. Um, I find if I talk for an hour, everyone is just kind of zoned out at the end of it. So please feel free to ask any questions. Um, I suspect we might go a little bit longer than an hour. This is a fairly uh, detailed, uh, complex topic. It's also near and dear to my heart. And so there's a, I'm, I'm going to try to cover everything um as uh as well and, and concisely as possible and uh not get too too much into the weeds and go too far into jargon but i did want to use a little bit of jargon and introduce everyone uh to this to that and uh, some common terms that are going to be used and uh, just to give everyone who uh, may not be a, a a professional ecologist or anything like that so uh, an introduction to some terms that they'll probably hear used when uh, people are discussing ecological functions. <clears throat> so I work for the Beaver Watershed Alliance. I am a geospatial ecologist, and basically that, that is an ecologist who does uh, mapping 
uh, maps have kind of shifted from analogous or paper maps to more electronic or online virtual maps um, created through software. And uh, that allows us to look at complex data in a spatial or temporal time sense and uh, allow us to visualize that data for better understanding, analysis, and uh, sharing information with stakeholders and uh, the public and folks like that. So the Beaver Watershed Alliance, our primary mission is to protect, enhance, and sustain the water quality of Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. We primarily do that through education and outreach, technical assistance, and uh, planning and analysis. Myself, I, I do a lot of the planning analysis, uh, assisting uh, uh, my colleagues with uh, maps, data, and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> We currently have seven staff members. Uh, we are actively hiring a program director and we'll, I, I suspect we'll be announcing that very soon, but I, I can't announce that on here just yet. And uh, we do have uh, experts in um, stream and forests, uh, outreach and several other things. So we have a, a 20 member board of directors and uh, the Beaver Watershed is up here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, it starts, the headwaters are around uh, east of St. Paul. The White River actually flows north, goes up into Beaver Lake until it hits Beaver Dam. Everything upstream of Beaver Dam, we consider the Beaver, Beaver Lake watershed. And uh, that water flows into Table Rock Lake, eventually Bull Shoals Lake, and eventually the White River meets the Mississippi River uh, near the town of uh, Watson, Arkansas. Uh, the Beaver, Water, Beaver Lake watershed is a part of the Arkansas State Priority Watersheds. Uh, it's a it's a drinking water reservoir, and uh, so like some of the other drinking water reservoirs, it's considered high priority. <clears throat> the lake is an artificial lake. It was impounded in the 1960s primarily for flood control and hydroelectric power, and later uh, drinking water was was added to this. Uh, it's a roughly 1,200 square mile watershed, and uh, consists of about 763,000 acres. Uh, we are primarily defined by uh, steep slopes, springs, seeps, and uh, karst geology, very, very porous, uh, apparent material, water flows through pretty quickly, uh, stores a lot of water, but it's also susceptible to, uh, to contamination, pollutants, and things like that. We're a heavily forested watershed, but we also, a quarter of our watershed is pasture, and 7% primarily the south part of Fayetteville is developed. Beaver Lake is extremely important for Northwest Arkansas. It's one of the most fast growing regions in the entire United States. Um, I've seen anywhere from 14th in the nation to uh, I believe one point I saw it was fourth in the nation. But we currently uh, provide drinking water for roughly one in six Arkansans or half a million, 500,000. Uh, water goes from the lake all the way to the Harrison, Arkansas, east of here and uh, the Oklahoma border. Uh, provides electricity, recreation, tourism, and is a kind of a cornerstone of our community. It's a huge economic driver for, for Northwest Arkansas. Uh, we prioritize uh, managing erosion. Uh, erosion is the number one pollutant and contaminant for drinking water sources. So we see this uh, heavily incised banks uh, due, to, due to land management practices or natural disturbance, which we'll talk about more in detail. Uh, Infrastructure such as roads. We also um, uh, urban infrastructure can like roads and uh, housing developments, things like that can also cause uh, erosion and sedimentation. So we look at uh, seeking solutions through various ways, such as urban stormwater, invasive species removal, engaging stakeholders in the community through uh, outdoor recreation, holding workshops and uh, volunteer training opportunities. And uh, <clears throat> we have a great selection of partners who uh, are absolutely invaluable during this. So right, let's get into what, what disturbance is. So what, it, what it is disturbance? So this is a term that's commonly used in society to just basically mean an interruption of a settled and peaceful condition. You know, you're in a quiet room, someone walks in, makes a lot of noise. It's a disturbance. Uh, if you're in a, in a library and someone is yelling and screaming, that's a disturbance. If you're at a crowded football game and someone tells you to shush when everyone else is yelling and screaming, that's also kind of a, a social disturbance. 
<clears throat> or in this case, you know, a social disturbance is just some poor random person walk, looking at the pretty wildflowers at the at the local nursery, and you know, folks like myself are telling them how destructive those exotic species are, and you know, the benefits of, a, of native plants and why they shouldn't be planting that uh, barberry and why they should be planting uh, goldenrod or something like that instead. But uh, in terms of ecology, so there are a few different definitions of what, what constitutes a disturbance. And, uh, but primarily, it's any change in the, uh, any change that causes mortality or causes a spatial disruption in the population, uh, population levels, causes mortality or population loss. And that's, that's primarily what defines eco ecological disturbance. And uh, you'll sometimes hear the term uh, ecological stress uh, used as well. And these, are, these are a little bit different. So a disturbance causes mortality like we talked about. And uh, stress is a little bit different. So stress tends to reduce productivity and that may actually lead to mortality. So here on the left, we have a, a young fawn who's laying down in grass. You know, the young fawn, its mass is, is stressing the grass underneath it, but it's not really killing the grass. So that's a stress. But if we have, you know, that fawn grows up and it's eating flowers or it's eating plants, you know, it's pulling the plants out by the root, you know, that causes mortality. Even though it's natural, that's considered a disturbance. So we see, here's some examples of, of disturbances. So we have landslides, tornadoes, floods, you know, the deer we talked about is herbivory, wildfires, erosion, uh, channelization of streams. Uh, here on this stream, we have a, uh, a stream that is kind of channelized on that, on that right-hand side. Or you might see these little uh, tiny streams that are kind of in the middle of the main channel. And uh, streams tend to move a lot, and this is what we call anastomosis. So that's some of that jargon that I, I'll talk about. So streams move a lot. And when they move, they create oxbows, they create secondary channels, they deposit sediment, they erode. And so this is a major source of natural disturbance. Uh, tree falls is a great example. Uh, ice storms as well. And there are lots of others. So what about this one? So just some people walking through the woods, you know, is, is this what you'd consider a disturbance? Well, it actually is a disturbance. It's a very, very small disturbance. So every, every time a person is walking through the forest and their, foot's, their foot lands on the ground, their mass is, is affecting the soil microbes and they're affecting the soil biota. Um, so they're actually impacting the the subterranean life or any seeds that might be germinating coming up through the through the uh, through the pine needles or leaf litter or something like that and they may actually kill that seedling just by stepping on it not not even knowing it's there so that that can actually be a disturbance even the the creation of the of the path going through the forest is a is a disturbance Hey, and a uh, quick question. Uh, yeah. Tom Utley asked, are beaver dams considered a disturbance? Absolutely. Yeah, beaver dams are absolutely a disturbance. Um, very natural, very beneficial. Um, but uh, beaver dams up a stream. Uh, typically, the dam, oftentimes the dams go through a series of failures before, the, before they build a successful dam. So they build up a dam the, and water erodes around the sides. The dam fails, then all of a sudden you've got uh, flooding downstream, and uh, when the dam before the dam has failed, you've got flooding upstream, and so that flooding is a, is a disturbance caused by the beaver. Um, you might have plants that were growing uh, in the stream bed upstream that were that are now inundated that weren't before. So you know those are those are affected by that by the creation of that beaver dam, even though it's perfectly natural. So you have natural disturbances and human caused disturbances. And so a lot of times what we see with human caused disturbances is land use change. Now, a lot of times people think this is like urban development, but this can also be agricultural development. Um, if you have a forest that's cleared for, for row crops or pasture or something like that, that's, that's a disturbance. Uh, nutrient input, what, we, what us wonks call eutrophication, uh, that's a disturbance. Canopy change, you know, go in and clear cut, push all the brush down and, and burn it. You know, you're left with uh, exposed soil that's prone to erosion, things like that. Invasive species introductions, 
you know, conventionally what we think of as pollution. So here you got an image of, uh, I tell you to advance. Here you got an image of uh, a petrochemical that's floating on top of the water. You know, that's that's conventional what people think of as, as pollution, but so is uh, just sediment going into the into the waterway. This is, like I said earlier, the number one cause, of, the number one pollutant of waterways. It's just pure pure mud, plain old mud. Channelization of streams, you know, a person uh, mowing their lawn is another great example. And the, uh, this is one that a lot of people are starting to become more aware of is the concentration of stormwater due to impervious surfaces as a, as a consequence of that development. So you take a plot of land and you, you clear it out and you put a bunch of houses on top of it. Well, first, before they put in the houses, they tend to put down a, a clay layer. That clay is very impervious. And uh, so even though it's green, it's got grass on top of it, a lot of times it's not very pervious. So water just shoots right off the houses, rooftops, uh, down, the, down the gutters, through the French drains. And it flows across this really impervious landscape until it meets a stream. But uh, on the landscape scale, there's a lot less water going, or there's a lot less water going down into the soil and a lot more water going into those adjacent streams than, than it was historic. Um, so you have basically a, a change in that natural pattern. So more concentration of water going into those streams increases the force of the water within the stream system, causes erosion, causes sedimentation. And that's, that's a, a very, very common uh, form of, of human caused disturbance we're seeing uh, in, in today's society. So how does disturbance work in nature? So basically, ecosystems progress in a, in a predictable pattern that we call succession. So, you know, anytime something passes away, something comes after it, and that's just kind of a conventional uh, definition of succession. And uh, landscapes, ecosystems are the same. And basically, what disturbance does is it resets that, that succession. So it takes that linear progression and moves it back like you're like you're rewinding a movie or something like that. And the basically the magnitude of that disturbance is determines how far back the the system is reset or it's proportion or the the reset is proportional to the disturbance. And uh, this is kind of a, a a good example of what that succession looks like. In this case, this is a primary and secondary succession. Uh, Primary succession is what we call these, these first three slides here on the left, these first three uh, panels. And uh, so you have like a bare rock. Um, this, is, this is what uh, would actually be dirt. So a lot of times people say, well, you can't, soil isn't dirt. Um, technically, dirt is inert. It's inorganic. You know, uh, what you have in your garden isn't dirt. Uh, what's on Mars is dirt. So it's inorganic. Uh, there's no carbon in the soil or no carbon in the dirt. Uh, life can't really grow in it. And so we have these pioneer species like lichens and mosses and things like that that come in and start chewing away on that dirt and breaking down those rocks and gradually sl slowly converting it to soil. And it takes about 500 years for one inch of soil to, to be created. But over time, when you get more of that soil, you can start getting small plants and you start getting grasses and perennials. And uh, so grasslands and prairies and things like that, they're in this state, the grasses and perennials. They have enough soil where they can, um, they can sustain and they don't have a lot of interruptions um, or they have enough interruptions keeping trees and things like that out. But if something isn't keeping the trees out, over time you move to the next phase of succession and you start seeing little shrubs come in. And those little shrubs over time get replaced by bigger shrubs and then small trees, typically conifers and things like that. And then over time, the conifers like pines and cedars are replaced by more mature trees like oak trees and hickories. And then we get on to, uh, here in Arkansas, we get it to what's, uh, what's really considered a climax forest. And uh, you see a lot of this around the, the Buffalo River region. And you start seeing more maples and beaches. Now, these are really, really uh, old, you know, old growth. Uh, uh, forests that haven't experienced a lot of disturbance, and so they're able to grow these really, really old trees uh, that that um, <clears throat> are a little bit more more mature, more more uh, competitive than than oaks and hickories. 
But if you have a disturbance that comes in on the scene, it takes this cycle, and like I said, someone basically comes in and pushes a big reset button and winds it all the way back to, to some point previously. So it might take that back to a grassland or it might take that back to uh, a shrubland or something like that. Um, in the case of an ex well, like a, glac a glacier retreating, uh, it takes it all the way back to rock and uh, dirt or a volcanic eruption is a great example. Um, like Krakatoa was a massive volcanic eruption in the, in the Southwest Pacific and um, it left an island that had no vegetation on it, no, uh, no soil whatsoever. And so we well, started studying this uh, primary succession, basically started seeing rocks come back and or lichens come back, things like that. So basically, so how can we quantify disturbance? Well, there's, there's uh, several different um, criteria you can use. You can use frequency. Let's go back to that for just a second. So frequency, so this is like a, what's called a fire regime group. Um, basically, uh, wildfires were very common to the United States. And so there's been a lot of study to determine, well, how frequent were these wildfires historically? And we'll see this map again later. But um, this is a, a map that shows the frequency of these wildfires throughout the United States. Um, <clears throat> you can also do intensity. So that's just the physical size, the physical strength of a, uh, of a disturbance event. In this case, it's a hurricane. So like a hurricane is a massive in scale, takes up a large area, and this has a lot of potential. Uh, timing is a major uh, disturbance factor. So if you hear you have a frost, and if a frost occurs during the early spring, it's not that much of a deal. But if it occurs in like late April, that can be extremely destructive because the plants are coming up, they're mature, they're much more susceptible to the damage of that frost. And so the timing is very important. Um, duration, you know, we just came out of a, a, of a historic drought here in Arkansas that lasted, oh gosh, a month and a half. And so that's you know, that's having a, uh, a big impact on, on uh, wildlife and uh, flora here in Arkansas. Um, extent, so if you have like, you know, it's kind of a spatial sense. So if you have big patches that have been burned off, like you see here in the middle, and you have smaller patches that have been burned, um, those smaller patches tend to recover faster than the bigger patches. And then you have severity. And people tend to con confuse severity and intensity, but severity is basically a, a, a measure of the biological impact that disturbance has on the ecosystem. So here you see a small fire on the ground. Um, this doesn't really affect the trees that much. It's not really gonna do that much damage to the trees. Um, it's gonna burn off a lot of the, the understory uh, litter, like here, duff, pine needles, or leaf litter. And if you get a bigger fire, you start it starts burning off some of the young seedlings and killing those, but you might also see it going up an old dead tree or a snag like we see here in the back center, and uh, it can it can remove those and convert that material and those resources and nutrients in that in that old dead tree back to the soil, <clears throat> as well as burning up some of the young seedlings. And then we have you know a really really severe disturbance such as a canopy fire or a crown fire that's gonna that you know kill mature trees. And uh, in some cases, it can burn so hot, it could sterilize the soil. So <clears throat> those are ways that we can quantify those disturbances, but they can also synergize. This is when things get really complicated. So up here in the top left, you have just a natural stream. It has natural erosion. So erosion occurs naturally in streams. And you'll start seeing incising of these banks, and you'll start seeing some of the banks you know, falling off, going into the stream. And that can input nutrients into the waterways. And if it's an excessive amount of nutrients, you'll see a lot of these algal blooms forming. Uh, you know, like I said, what we call it eutrophication. But land management can also cause that. So if come, someone comes in and uh, removes the canopy entirely, that can also cause that erosion, which can all, which goes back to the nutrient input. <laughs> so that can cause nutrient input, but also that land, that uh, canopy removal might be to land, due to land change, or might be to, to, to create a land change, such as the creation of a subdivision or urban development. 
And then the creation of that urban development, like we talked about earlier, puts more water into the system. You know, people putting fertilizer on their lawn and things like that also puts nutrients into the nearby waterways. Um, if people plant invasive plant species in that neighborhood, those invasive plants go out into the local natural areas, nearby forests, and uh, start excluding and removing, uh, out-competing native flora and converting um, good understory vegetation into bare soil. And that also creates a nutrient input. So these are several ways that these various, uh, these various disturbances can synergize and each one independently adds nutrients into these nearby waterways. And so that's why in urban areas you see uh, these green algal, algal field uh, ditches, streams, and things like that. And uh, <clears throat> so this is one of my favorite examples. Does anyone know what this is, what we're looking at here? Eric, do you know what this is? Um, uh, hard to tell. So this is what's called a deer exclusion area. Oh, okay. So, uh, one of the big problems and big challenges in urban forests is the concentration of deer. Uh, you know, we don't have, we don't want wolves, we don't want mountain lions, we don't want bears hanging around urban areas. So uh, over time, we've kind of driven those predators away that keep those deer populations down. So that fits nowadays, the deer out. It's just to keep the deer out. And so nowadays, these deer exclusion or nowadays, uh, the biggest predator of deer in North America is auto or auto, automobiles. <clears throat> and so this is an area where they fenced off an area in an urban forest just to keep the deer out, just to see what effect it would have. And so what they found is the deer, are, the these deer are uh, a, a source of massive disturbance and stress on na na native floral communities. It's so basically what they do is they just go around and they're coming out of winter time. They're hungry, uh, depending on the, the previous fall's mass production of acorns, things like that. They might be, frankly, starving in some locations. And so basically anything green coming up, they devour. Um, <clears throat> and so these deer exclusion areas were basically put in to see, well, if we keep, keep the deer from eating everything, you know, what comes up? And so they're finding... Uh, rare plants like trilliums, golden seal, and things like that uh, just naturally come up in these places, whereas otherwise they would have been devoured uh, in March and April. And so, <clears throat> so how does disturbance drive biodiversity? So in a natural system, you know, looking at the stream, it's a very sinuous stream, and basically as water is flowing through this stream, each one of these bends that stream is exerting through centrifugal force. It's exerting force on that opposite bank. Every time it does that, it saps a little bit of the strength out of the, uh, out of the stream until it hits the next bank and the next bank. And as the stream is flowing downhill, it's, it's building up force due to gravity. But at the same time, it's reducing its force every time it hits a, hits a bend or it hits an obstruction. <clears throat> and every, and, when it's exerting that force on the landscape, it's causing erosion. And sometimes it creates a new channel due to that erosion. And so here on the left side, you might see these, these oxbows or what, they, what we call these anabranches, anastomosed, anastomized branches. Um, that's where fertile sediment has been deposited. So it's really, really great for flora, uh, really, really loose uh, soil. And uh, one of my favorite examples is looking at all the, all the channel scars of the Mississippi River, just to show people how much rivers move over, the, over geologic time, over the course of millennia. So this is a satellite imagery, based, LIDAR basically takes the elevation. And this is a, a piece that a gentleman put together just to show all of the anastomized branches or channel scars at the Mississippi River near, near Memphis. <clears throat> and so every one of these areas where it's lighter, you're going to have a uh, younger fertile soil that's been deposited. And so you're going to see different floral compositions in those areas versus some of the darker areas, which tend to be higher elevation and probably uh, comprised of less fertile soil. So just looking at this incredible matrix of, uh, of soil deposition, you know, every one of these, every one of these pure points where in the river, crests its bank and deposits soil in a floodplain is a disturbance. And so it's that disturbance that is actually driving uh, biodiversity in this case, in this, in this example. 
And so when we talk about ecolo ecological niches, uh, mild uh, restoration ecology professor Sally Intrican would say, think of ecological niches more like every little piece, every little uh, every little spot of color you see in a kaleidoscope. And that's basically what an ecological niche is. Um, imagine an organism just picking one of those colors and saying, this is my home. And, uh, <clears throat> and there's, you know, thousands or millions of them. But it, each one of them has different uh, moisture factors, nutrients, uh, shelter for, for plants and animals and things like that. So imagine each one of these little pieces of light you see here through this kaleidoscope is, uh, is unique and every animal or animals that inhabit that little spot is uniquely adapted to the conditions of that spot. And that's an ecological niche. <clears throat> so basically a disturbance kind of forces a check or forces a response of the community. And pretty much when, it, when a disturbance occurs, you know, we talked about earlier that disturbance causes mortality. Um, that disturbance forces the, the population, be they plant or animal, to make one of three choices. They can either adapt, disperse, or if they can't do one of those, they just die. They just die and they become extirpated from the community. And uh, that ecological niche is, is opened up for something else that is adapted to, to inhabit that niche. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing to consider with adaptation is it takes, it takes an incredible amount of time, um, even you know, millions of years for, for species to, to adapt to, to new ecosystems. And uh, not every species is able to disperse into new ecosystem. You know, an oak tree can't just pick up and move. And so some species are better, are obviously just better adapted to, to disturbances. So like some species are really adaptable and what we call sprinters. Um, they, have, they have no problem uh, dispersing into new locations. So like mice, for example, they're small, they don't require a lot, they reproduce quickly, and they can just pick up and move. Whereas larger species tend to be more like uh, enduring marathon runners. So like an elephant or an oak tree, it's there, it's there, it occupies its space. And it's not as, it's not as able to just pick up and relocate somewhere else. <clears throat> so here we're looking at an oak tree. It's, uh, it's growing large. It's taking up a lot of space and it's really, really competitive. You look under the oak tree, you don't see a lot of things growing under it because that oak tree is taking up all that water, it's taking up that space, um, it's competing for pollinators, and it's, it's generally a very, very competitive species because it's, uh, it produces large fruit, it's long-lived, so it's, it's kind of playing the long game. And it's a very long-lived species. <laughs> now we compare that to a very short-lived perennial, and that's cardinal flower. <clears throat> so cardinal flower is very small, uh, the seed are just, they're basically dust, and they tend to live in highly disturbed areas like roadsides, ditches, uh, marshlands, and things like that, and that's because they're much more able to disperse. Uh, if there's a flood, the cardinal flower just deposits these tiny little seeds in the, in the, in the flood waters, and they just flow downstream. <clears throat> and as you can tell from all the seed, it's got uh, a lot of opportunities for, you know, one or two cardinal flowers to mature go to flower and produce seed downstream. <clears throat> so in that case, the cardinal flower is actually much better able to respond to that disturbance than the oak tree is. <clears throat> so the sprinters that we talked about earlier, like the mice and the cardinal flowers, they tend to thrive when that disturbance is high because they can, they can exploit that disturbance. They can, they can just go somewhere else typically. Uh, they tend to be uh, small sized, short lived, they mature and reproduce quickly or early, they have, typically they have fairly generalized needs, numerous offspring, and they have, each one of those offspring tend to have low survivability. And those marathoners, they tend to be large sized, lar longer lived, and they mature and reproduce slowly in comparison, they have more specialized needs, uh, fewer offspring, but each one of those offspring has a very high chance of survivability. And these are, these are generally, this is a, a general rule. There are exceptions. And this occurs along a gradient too. So it's not, it's not a, you're either one or the other. Um, pretty much all life on earth is somewhere along this spectrum. 
Um, so the sprinters tend to be more adaptable to change, whereas those marathoners tend to be more competitive in stable situations. And this comes from what we what is commonly referred to as RK selection hypothesis or RK selection theory. Um, the R is basically the sprinters and the K are basically these marathoners. <clears throat> And here in Arkansas, at least, we have some, some common, uh, more opportunistic species that would represent those sprinters. So in this case, if you take a, if you take a tree fall in the forest, it's a fantastic thing to study. Um, walk out in the forest, find a tree that's really recently fallen, and just watch over the next two years what comes up, what, especially what plants come up. So you'll, think, you'll see things like eastern red cedar, winged elm, all these species on the left, um, almost Almost always, if you go in and you you see a disturbed area, especially where the soil's been disturbed, you'll see pokeweed come up or uh, burnweed, um, horse nettle, wild lettuce, and things like this. So these are species that are extremely adapted to moving in and taking over that, exploiting that opportunity, that blank slate that's been created due to that disturbance. <clears throat> and so basically what, what excess disturbance does is it homogenizes the landscape, reduces the number of niches, and promotes those promotes more generalist species, because those species are better able to adapt in this really, really uh, highly disturbed environments. Um, so you see things like annual weeds, flies, uh, deer, rabbit, coyotes, raccoons, opossums, hawks, mice, and you might realize, hey, these are things that we commonly see around urban areas and heavily agricultural areas. And that's because those species are better able to adapt to that highly disturbed environment in the ecosystem. And the, these, uh, this excessive disturbance tends to reduce those specialist species. So we see th fewer things like perennial wildflowers, quail, orchids, uh, highland stream fishes like darters here in Arkansas, uh, and species specific pollinators like uh, bumblebees. And so this is a good example. So if you start off with a pretty diverse landscape up here in the top and you have an increasing level of disturbance going down, you start seeing fewer and fewer species as the landscape becomes more homogenized. And it tends to select or select for those generalist species. <clears throat> and this is a case where uh, you walk out and a lot of times, you know, the landscape tells you a story. So if you're walking out, especially around an urban area, this is something you're going to see a lot. This is a, uh, a what was likely a former cattle pasture that was clear cut and was left uh, unmanaged for probably, this is probably 20 years. So everything was clear cut and it, grasses and then shrubs and younger trees started to come up. And uh, so what that created was kind of a uniform height. All those trees are about the same age. And you start seeing things like uh, many vines coming up. Uh, many of those young seedlings kind of have, uh, they're, they're thin and twisted because they're, they're, they're exceedingly dense and uh, the population is, ex is excessively dense. So they're all fighting with each other and they're competing for space and sunlight. And as they do that, there's this uh, process called phototropism where they're actively moving to, to find light and uh, that movement over time causes the, that unhealthy twisting uh, growth. You'll also see uh, a canopy that's dominated by those fast growing species like eastern red cedar, uh, some of the ones we talked about earlier like eastern red cedar, um, uh, persimmon, green ash, uh, black cherry, things like that. They're all native species, but they're just more attuned to, to competing in that kind of condition. So is there kind of a happy medium for that for disturbance? And this is when we get into a theory called the intermediate disturbance theory that has some challenges, but there's still some, still some truth to it. And as we learn, we're kind of finding that, hey, there, is except, there are exceptions to this rule as well. And this especially uh, is not a one size fits all rule or approach. But basically what it says is if you have no disturbance, bad things happen. And if you have excess or maximum disturbance, bad things happen. So you get the more biodiversity in general when you have a, a medium level of disturbance. But what we're finding is, you know, a lot of times if you have a, a species that's of high conservation concern, 
like uh, ornate box turtles or a lot of a lot of darters, uh, things like that, then they don't do well with that hot, with any any disturbance whatsoever. So if you're wanting to to protect those, conserve or preserve those, you may be better off with a management strategy that that doesn't use much disturbance or uses a disturbance that takes those populations into account. And so the best thing to do is use use a disturbance regime or use a pattern of disturbance and management uh, style that reflects the historic disturbance patterns or what we call the disturbance regime because that is the that is the disturbance pattern that the species of that ecosystem have evolved and have adapted to over time <clears throat> so this is a good example of a 1937 aerial photo of a oak savanna i believe in uh, wisconsin and you see um fairly open on the southern side of that hill and that's due to the sunlight hitting the hillside less moisture as opposed to the northern side of this hill where there's more moisture due to you know due to differences in, in sunlight exposure and evaporation so the image doesn't show this but what you'd see is a lot of wildflowers and things like that on the southern side because they would be taking advantage of that open canopy and the light so you'd probably see things like asters and and uh, lytris and milkweed and things like that growing on the southern side of this this slope but over time in the 1990 they found that removing wildfire from the from the picture from the disturbance regime caused a caused a process known as uh <clears throat> we'll talk about it in a second but basically caused uh, trees to through succession to grow into this hillside and and create a, a dense canopy that excluded or removed all of those less competitive species like grasses and wildflowers and things like that <clears throat> and so even though you have trees, more trees on the landscape, you have a reduction in that biodiversity because the trees, you know, you might have one or two species of trees, but have replaced dozens of species of grasses and flowers and things like that. And this is a process that we're really seeing a lot in, in a modern society called mesification. And that is the, the densification of existing forest and the expansion of forest into locations where forests have not historically existed. <clears throat> and as those forests become ex extremely or increasingly dense, you're seeing a loss in biodiversity and you're seeing a loss in overall uh, conservation value. And uh, so it's kind of a it's kind of a misnomer. A lot of people, you know, we really value trees, but at the same time, we're we're sometimes valuing trees at the cost of biodiversity and at the cost of grasses and forbs, wildflowers and things like that that also serve to uh, process carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, process um, water filtration through the soil and uh, promote pollinators and things like that. So trees are great, but trees shouldn't be, trees shouldn't be the be all and end all of management strategies. So they came in in this location, they came in and uh, did an extensive savanna restoration. They did an ecological thin, took out a lot of the trees and uh, they were able to find out that a lot of those native wildflowers and grasses, they had produced seed that were already in the seed bank. And so they came up naturally once the canopy had been cleared. So they started seeing uh, more butterflies and wild birds and things like that. And uh, as I showed here, some of the, some of the old, old trees that were still alive in 1937 were still present here in this, in this photo in 2007. This is a good example of that mesification. So here on the left, you see young trees that have that twisting to them. You'll also see a lot of really, really small seedlings coming up, really competing with each other. Uh, a, a numerous amount of vines is also an indication, an indication of, uh, of mesification in an urban setting um, because those vines uh, are highly adapted and highly competitive to, to seeking that sunlight. And they're one of the species that aren't really competing with the trees. They're actually able to use those trees to their advantage. Whereas grasses and wildflowers, they tend to die out or become extirpated. Those vines tend to take over. And so you see a conversion from this open canopy with fairly spread out trees and wildflowers, things like that underneath them to these really, really dense, brooding, dark urban forests comprised of these sickly young trees that are usually covered and choked in vines. 
And uh, these, these ecosystems on the left are also highly prone to erosion, uh, disease. Uh, they don't get much airflow through the, through the understory that's going to encourage pollination and encourage um, uh, redu reduction in, in diseases. They're just not fun to walk through. They're really prone to invasive species uh, taking over. And uh, I forget where this is. I, I took this from the uh, Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. <clears throat> but this is a good indicator of a, of a more open, up, open uh, oak and uh, I believe pine savanna. And you see things like culver's root, native ryegrasses, and things like that in here. And this is much more biodiverse, uh, much more beneficial for wildlife, and uh, just, just at more ecologically valuable in, in general compared to the image on the left. Another example of a overgrown oak savanna with mystification. So looking at this tree kind of tells a story, has these fairly, sh fairly sharp angles. That tells you this is a, a tree that grew up around other trees, but it was still fairly open. And so this is heavily overgrown, a lot of surrounded by really, really dense, young, twisted, sickly seedlings. They came in, this is the, this is the same tree over here on the left. I'm just looking at it from a different perspective. But uh, they cleared out, did an ecological thin, cleared out the understory, and uh, performed a, a restoration here. And this is the same year, probably in the fall, after they cleared the understory. And this is the same location three, just three years later in the spring. And so you see how much more biomass is there. There's going to be much more rootstock in the soil, holding the soil in place. And these plants are converting uh, material uh, in the soil, converting CO2 to rootstock and to plant material that's creating and building soil rather than um, you know, reducing it. And so you see things like golden rods. Uh, here's Joe Pie weed and uh, bottle brush rye. And so you have uh, really, really beneficial pollinator producing or pollinator supporting plants here as well. And uh, oak trees, you know, they support a, a massive number of pollinators, but um, any kind of homogenized uh, ecosystem is, is not going to be beneficial for, for uh, species. And here you have a good example on the left, a uh, really dense, uh, poorly managed forest. Here we have that uh, 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 tree bending out towards the road, that phototropism where it's trying to access that sunlight, just showing that this, this forest canopy is too dense because the plants are, are acting in unhealthy ways to, to compete with each other. Versus on the right, it's fairly open. You see much more greenery on the ground and uh, <clears throat> as opposed to the one on the left. So that disturbance regime is long term is basically long term pattern of disturbance associated with that ecosystem, and uh, it's important to know that that historic disturbance regime is are the conditions that the local flora and fauna have adapted to over millennia, and so any management actions should try their, should absolutely try to emulate that historic pattern to accommodate all those species that have evolved and adapted to those local conditions. And if you, if you take a good management tactic or good management tool, even like uh, uh, prescribed burning or something like that, and you try to impose that onto the wrong ecosystem that has not had that as a component of its disturbance regime, it can, it can be disastrous or just not, not effective. And, um, a lot of times you hear people talk about, um, unfortunately, that you know, uh, nature will fix itself and things like that. Just leave it alone. It will take care of itself. But that, unfortunately, doesn't account for the fact that humans are on the landscape. Humans have impacted the landscape. And in almost every situation in the continental United States, even in remote forests, humans have done something to introduce a factor that those native flora and fauna have not adapted to over millennia. So it could be changing that disturbance regime, uh, fire suppression, removing wild, removing naturally occurring wildfire, wildfires out of the, out of the, the formula. And, uh, you know, that's, that is a, a, uh, variable that humans have introduced and to just take a step back and decide to not manage that eco ecosystem and let it, you know, regenerate on its own doesn't take that into account. It can be disastrous and backfire. So lack of management can just be another 
uh, can be synonymous with neglect, depending on the, the situation. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, that map again of the fire frequency of the United States. Um, you see certain areas like Southeast Texas, really, really, really common, uh, historically speaking, during 1650 through 1850, uh, to have to have naturally occurring wildfires. So about you know less than two years. Same with the uh, most of the Panhandle of, or most of uh, Southern Florida and Southern Georgia. Whereas you get up into like the northern part of New England and a lot of places, the Pacific Northwest, the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, mountain ranges out west, you know, uh, fire is much less common. And here in, here in Arkansas, we see uh, fire is fairly common here historically. So even in the, the Boston Mountains and some of the western part of the Washita's, you, we had about a wildfire would occur about every six to eight years in, a, in any location. <clears throat> Whereas in the eastern part of the Washita's and the, and the uh, Ozark Highlands, it would be about every four to six years. And in some other locations, it would be two to four years. And typically in these two to four year ranges, we didn't historically see many, many uh, forests because the fires would basically burn out all the underbrush, burn out a lot of the uh, younger trees, younger seedlings and prevent that succession cycle from going from grasslands to, to forests. So you would see a lot of shrublands and things like that, and very few forests. <clears throat> Whereas in these uh, more yellow areas and uh, lighter orange areas, you'd see much more developed forests that would be you know, fire adapted and things like that. And uh, so historically, much of the Mississippi River Valley and, uh, and uh, Arkansas River Valley have been grasslands and and uh, things like that. So many of y'all are familiar with the Blacklands Prairie area in Southeast Arkansas, and this is why. And so <clears throat> we commonly see this image or iterations of it, comparing native plant species roots to non-native plant species roots. And it's a, it's a little misleading because a lot of the native species that are used in these images are prairie species. And so they're they're fire adapted and they're drought adapted. So they naturally have deep roots going into the soil to store resources in the event of being burned off in a fire or to reach the table, water table to access uh, you know, water during droughts. And so <clears throat> they have adapted to, to that disturbance, fire and drought, whereas non-native species have not. Non-native species tend to be from uh, a lot of times Europe or East Asia, and those those ecosystems there are not fire adapted or, or really experience drought very often. So they tend to have shallow roots. But it's a little bit misleading because a lot of our species, which aren't prairie species, also don't sometimes don't have deep roots also because they don't have to, because they've been in uh, areas where um, there is easily accessible water, the water table is shallow, and things like that, or they're less drought prone areas. So they tend to have shallower roots. That's still not a reason to not plant native plants, you know, absolutely. Uh, you should always opt for planting native plants over, over exotic species. But this gives you an idea, a more uh, sound reason of why they have those deep roots. <clears throat> so anytime you're, you're planning a management strategy for, a, for any kind of a, uh, ecosystem. These are the things you kind of want to do. You want to identify the goals. What do you want? Are you wanting to achieve overall biodiversity? Are you trying to um, assist a specific species? Uh, or are you trying to look for an overall community like pollinators? Or are you protecting you know, something specifically like uh, uh, rose gentian or something like that? <laughs> and uh, you know, your management actions should reflect what you're trying to, what, what your goal is. So it's good to, to go in and assess what you have. What are you missing? Uh, are, do you have any priority features? Do you have uh, um, marshes, wetlands, barrens, uh, floodplains, things like that, glades on, on, the, on the property? Do you have any threats on the property, like uh, invasive species that could be either on the property or externally and uh, receive constant introduction through seed or things like that? Um, is it an area that's prone to a lot of disturbance? Does it receive a lot of foot traffic? Does it receive a lot of uh, you know mowing 
or things like that. And uh, if you're not really sure, just get advice from someone. Uh, a botanist or an ecologist or someone like that can give you tips. A lot of, a lot of naturalists are, are really knowledgeable about these things. And uh, make a plan. Write it out. Uh, so, you know, set clear, obtainable goals uh, that you can work towards in steps. <clears throat> and uh, have, you know, good benchmarks. And this is probably the most important thing is to anticipate the ecological response. And this is where I see a lot of people... Um, Kind of, kind of forgetting this this key step. So basically, what this means is, if I go in and I do something, if I if I take out a bunch of invasive species, if I take out a lot of uh, you know bush honeysuckle or privet or something like that, I'm I'm creating a disturbance. Uh, it's for a good cause, but I'm creating a disturbance, and so something is going to take advantage of that ecological niche that I've I've vacated, I've opened up, and is it going to be something I want? Or is it going to be something that's nearby that's going that I don't want that's going to capitalize on that and exploit that opportunity I've created and uh, create a new problem for me to, to solve? And so we don't want to play invasive species whack-a-mole or put ourselves in this uh, Sisyphusian cycle of uh, eradicate the invasive and it comes back. So we got to eradicate it again and again and again. And so... Will my action create habitat for that potentially unwanted species? And this is what we call ecological release when that occurs. Um, so a lot of times what happens is people go in and they remove uh, bush honeysuckle, but then uh, native opportunists like uh, honey locust comes in or something like that. And so they see a, a explosion of that one other species. And will that, will, there, will that action favor some species over others? And so... If I have a uh, uh, oak forest that's overgrown and I come in and I, I thin it out and I clear it out um, and I'm wanting dogwoods and I'm wanting things like that, are they going to benefit from that if I, if I clear too much or if I thin too much? Or do I want to open it up more um, for pollinator habitat? As some species are going to want it more shady than others and some species are going to want uh, wetter conditions than others. And so your management actions are going to affect those, those variables. And so it's, it's really beneficial to think about that in advance before you, before you uh, impose that, that consequence on the community and put yourself in this reactive management cycle. <clears throat> and so this is a, a lovely place I saw uh, on the southern side of the Washtaws. Took this picture of an area that had been uh, ecologically thinned and had been burned off a few years before. This is in the springtime, so you can't see it's a little bit blurred in the background, but this is a deciduous holly that was growing there. And the whole area was just awash in these uh, um, golden ragwort. Just absolutely love this spot. And so what's the takeaway here? So ecological disturbance changes the ecological structure and it often causes mortality and forces population redistributions. So those, po those populations have to respond to that disturbance accordingly, and they can either adapt, disperse, or die. And hopefully you don't want, you know, you don't want that third one, so you want them to be able to adapt or, or disperse. <clears throat> and that disturbance uh, basically hits that reset button, slows or resets that successional cycle in proportion to the magnitude of the disturbance itself. And that's basically a really wordy saying of <clears throat> big disturbance, big re reset, or small disturbance, small reset, and that disturbance can also be a big or small in size, like the like the hurricane, or it can be small, like a like a tornado. And it can be long or short. It can be like a long long drought or a flood that lasts a couple days or a couple months. It can be strong or weak, like that hurricane is big, but on the periphery it's relatively weak. Whereas a tornado, not very large, but in right in the pathway of that tornado, it's it's very strong. Or it can be, usually it's any combination of those three categories. Those disturbances can also synergize with each other and they can amplify each other's effects. And uh, those sudden disturbances have the greatest potential to reduce biodiversity because again, if species can't adapt or disperse, they're going to die out. And you're when they die out, you're gonna lose biodiversity. <clears throat> and so the Plants and animals are adapted to the, an important thing is they're adapted to the natural and uh, historic disturbance regimes of their ecosystem. And so you're going to see 
prairie species, they're adapted to fire and they're adapted to drought. The species you'll see on the north slopes of mountains and hillsides, they're going to be adapted to uh, less drought. They're going to be more shade tolerant. And the species you're going to see on the southern slopes of hills, they're going to be more, more open sun, full sun, and uh, more drought resistant. And so you'll th see things like pines and post oaks on the southern side of hills and uh, um, maples and uh, beaches and things like that on the northern slopes, pawpaws and things like that. And so if you want to promote biodiversity in general, you want to do your best to emulate those natural historic uh, disturbance patterns on that in that ecosystem. And uh, if you're taking any management actions, use adaptive management strategies to, to maximize that biodiversity. You know, think about your actions, think about how the, the ecology is going to respond. And uh, if you <clears throat> problems you can create unintentionally with your management actions and how you can preemptively remove those challenges. So if you have, if you identify a dominant invasive species on the property you're managing, and uh, if you remove or eradicate that one dominant invasive plant species, but you've recognized that, hey, there's a second invasive plant species here that's not really dominant, but it will take over if I remove the, the dominant one. In that case, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually best to go in and remove the, the less dominant invasive so it, it's not there ready and waiting to take over and create a problem and uh, when you when you take up take out its competitor um, when you open up that ecological niche and you, you create a blank slate for it to take over so I could probably talk about that a lot longer but uh, I figure we might have questions and uh, I want to I want to thank everyone so much for inviting me to talk here this is a, it's a topic of passions very near and dear to my heart it's also uh, oftentimes a complex uh, topic. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to it, but um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. Yeah, thank you, Nate. That was great. Wonderful presentation and able to uh, explain such a concept, uh, complex uh, concepts uh, to where, you know, normal folks like us can understand. Looks like we already have one question from uh, Tom Lee. Uh, what is your thoughts about the trillion trees concept? I <sighs> I'm not entirely sure what the trillion trees concept is. Tom, I, think I, might... wanna, I'm, I was going to say, if Tom wants to unmute his microphone, feel free. I don't want to assume. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Well, in uh, apparently there's some legislation and thoughts actually around the globe of planting a trillion trees as a way of being able to um, naturally um, address uh, climate change. Okay. In um, uh, Pulling out the carbon dioxide and so on from the uh, from the air, and um, I just I've read some things about it and um, just thought about it a bit too. And just planting, what would be some of the um, I guess um, uh, risks and uh, consequences of of going ahead and trying to just plant a trillion trees? To make it. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I know what you're talking about now. So this is one of those topics. It's uh, fairly controversial, but I'll take a stab right. at it. <laughs> so this is a this is a, a well-meaning attempt to to address a, a serious problem and a, a serious form of, of long-term disturbance in the form of global climate change. And uh, we do see climate refugees here in real life. Uh, we see species starting to shift their natural range. So they're, they're dispersing, as I said earlier, and adapting to new ranges slowly. And uh, we're seeing their range in the Northern Hemisphere shift northward to accommodate for those uh, warmer, drier conditions and more volatile conditions. And uh, a lot of people want to address that. Um, we often tend to believe that, uh, you know, we know through photosynthesis, um, any, all plant matter basically takes carbon dioxide out of the air, converts it to sugars, but that is a case, that is a normal function with all plant life, not just trees. Um, trees do take in a lot of carbon dioxide and convert it to, to their plant matter, cellulose, uh, trunks, and things like that, but we kind of overlook some of the more humble plants like uh, grasses, wildflowers, things like that. They're not going to live as long as those trees, 
but they're still doing an incredible job pulling oxygen or pulling uh, carbon dioxide, CO2 out of the air, converting it to starches and then and, and converting it to rootstock. And even though they may not live as long as that oak tree, when they gradually die out, they're being replaced by, by new plants. And so grasslands are just as valuable. If, and I've seen arguments where they're actually more valuable in terms of pulling carbon dioxide out of the air uh, than, than trees. Because, But the, the sweet spot is usually that middle ground. So trees are great. Grasses are great. But why not both? So when you have that really, really dense forest canopy due to mesification we talked about earlier, you don't really have a lot of biomass. You see a lot of trees, but there's actually not that, there's not many really, really fibrous roots in the soil holding it in place. There's not any, uh, any uh, herbaceous grass growth on the forest floor. And so it's not processing as much CO, it's not, it's not processing as much CO2 and storing it in the soil as we would think, whereas uh, those grasslands are actually doing a lot. And so there are many, many uh, hazards to the trillion trees concept. Um, one of the foremost is obviously planting trees in places where they don't belong. There's no such thing as a wrong plant, but there is a, as a right plate, a right plant for the right place. And there's a wrong plant for the wrong place. And so we don't, we don't want to see people you know, planting bamboo in North America or planting tree of heaven or princess tree, um, things like that. And, uh, or even taking oak trees and maple trees and planting them in a, in a historic grassland um, because that can, you know, that can actually be really, comp really uh, destructive, uh, well-meaning, but destructive. And uh, like I said, you also have that risk of them planting uh, an exotic species that becomes invasive. Yeah, I think that's a lot of really great points, Nathan. Um, and, you know, I want to add to that, that I think there should be more of a focus on uh, the soil's ability to um, sequester carbon, especially like you mentioned, the soils beneath grasslands and even wetland soils are able to sequester much more carbon uh, than above ground biomass um, ecosystems like uh, forests and whatnot, because trees have a limit to how much biomass they'll sequester. And then when they die and decompose, you know, that above ground biomass that falls to the ground decomposes, releases a lot of that carbon back into the atmosphere. But, you know, grasses, which um, especially deep rooted perennial native grasses, you know, are putting those roots deep into the soil. And even when those plants die and those roots decompose, they're, you know, it's most of that soil uh, carbon's uh, remaining in the soil. And then the uh, anoxic conditions of wetland soils, um, you know, means that a lot of that um, organic matter is, you know, not breaking down. Uh, it's breaking down much more slowly than it's being decomposed. And so it's able to accumulate. And so I think if there was a focus on uh, preserving, conserving, and even recreating some of these ecosystems, that would be uh, an even greater way to sequester carbon than by creating you know, more forests. Not to say that, you know, we shouldn't focus on creating forests, but I think people tend to forget about the soil and focus a little too much on plants sometimes. Absolutely. And if I may add, uh, a lot of times those overgrown forests, you know, when a tree dies of old age in an overgrown forest, um, if there's not good herbaceous grasses and forbs on the ground, a lot of times that that leaf litter and uh, even the decomposing tree trunk, it's it that carbon is staying on top of the soil. It doesn't have anything that's that's pulling it down and putting it into the soil like the like grass roots and and flower roots will. And so even even though that tree is pulling a lot of CO two out of the atmosphere when it falls over in, in the condition of an overgrown forest, it's it's unfortunately not putting that that CO two where we want it in the soil, and uh, poses a risk as I, uh, it's increasing the fuel load of that forest and increasing wildfire risk. And uh, in, in that case, it's if that soil or if that CO2 is not in the soil and it's above ground, you run the risk of it just going right back up in the atmosphere, as, uh, as Eric mentioned. Well, th just one more, one more comment. Thank you very much for mentioning that because I think it's part of a conversation that is really missing. Okay, about uh, the, the maybe overvaluation of forests, okay, and trees, large grown trees, and the undervaluing of grass. I've, um, I've been very curious about that, and it seems what I've read, that grass really is, is not, it does not have much of a contribution, or it does not make much of a con positive contribution, but what I'm hearing from you is that it really does, as far as carbon sequestration. Have I understood that correctly? 
Absolutely. Hey, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna go on a different uh, trajectory and learn more about uh, just what you've said. Thank you. There's a really thank great you. graphic out there put out by the uh, International Panel for Climate Change showing uh, when they've measured uh, carbon sequestration by underground, like a uh, soil under various ecosystems versus above ground biomass. And it showed that, you know, the soil beneath grasslands and wetlands, uh, you know, we're able to sequester so much more carbon. So if you just Google IPP or IPCC um, soil carbon sequestration or something, Google images, sometimes you can come across that. Uh, and I just found it very, very eye opening. Thank you. Again, I think that's missing a big part of the conversation that's missing. I don't know if others um, uh, think so as well, but um, thanks again. I'll uh, sign off. <laughs> yeah, that was a great question, Tom. And another thing to add to that is uh, NASA came out with a uh, wonderful satellite view of Earth, uh, really demonstrating um, one, of the, one of the key things that contributes to CO2 in the atmosphere is actually deep Earth tilling. Because um, you're taking all that carbon that's in the soil and you're re by by mixing it for for tilling, you're reintroducing it to the surface where it can can evaporate or go back up in the atmosphere, get burned off, and things like that. And uh, NASA has this wonderful um, satellite uh, image showing through the years every season where you see CO2 in the atmosphere um, building up in the or excuse me decreasing over winter and decreasing in the spring, and then about June, July, or it, it really peaks, and that's because, like in a lot of in a lot of places where uh, agriculture is heavy, they're actively going in and, and tilling the soil, and so you see these big plumes of CO two going up off the off the Great Plains and places like that. It's a it's a really eye opening uh, series that I'd yeah. like to see too. Is a, a plug for no till soil, so no till farming, huh, and tilling. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to place a link to that graphic. Uh, just found it online. I'll place that in the chat. But while I'm doing that, uh, I think Sherry Lee, did you still have a question? I saw you had your hand held. If you do, feel free to unmute your microphone. Uh, and then we also have a few more questions in the chat that I'll get to. That that first question that he answered about um, the 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 trillion tree project was was what I had in mind. Um, people planting trees where trees shouldn't be. Gotcha. Okay. Sounds like your question was answered then, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Let's see here in the chat. Um, also, you got a lot of great feedback. Just people enjoyed your uh, presentation. Let's see, Maria Vertkin asks, could you talk a bit about how these concepts apply to ecosystems where trees slash forests are not the climax community or are trees universally a climax community everywhere? Oh, okay. Trees are typically a climax community. Um, just here, just here on Earth, um, typically with succession, that's that's what uh, any ecosystem could become is a climax community of trees. But just due to how far along they are in that successional cycle, you know, they may be limited. So an area may be uh, limited due to moisture or or it may be, you know, primarily rock or things like that. And so, not, like, currently, it might not be a climax forest community, but if, uh, if climate conditions changed, there were more moisture and, you know, over 5,000 years or something like that of lichen and mosses chewing away at those rocks and creating soil, they could eventually become those climax communities. I hope that answers your question. All right, thank you, Nate. Um, let's see, Andrea asks, uh, excellent, oh, she, or first of all comments, excellent overview of a deep topic. Any general advice for folks in suburban areas slash urban fringe, how should disturbance pressure or history be used in management? Yeah, that's a tough one. So any urban area is gonna be defined by really, really high disturbance. Uh, you take your conventional uh, American lawn, uh, someone is going out there and mowing it, you know, once a month. At least I think that's what you're supposed to do. I don't know. My neighbors probably hate me. <laughs> uh, but you know, every time you mow, every time you mow a lawn, you're you're cutting all that grass, and so that's that's a massive disturbance. 
So we've selected species for our lawns like Bermuda, Zoysia, uh, St. Augustine grasses and things like that, centipede grass that grow fairly low, have a uh, spread out root systems. And so they, they, are, they are okay with that disturbance. They're used to that disturbance. And that's why we've selected and cultivated those grasses um, so that, because they can, they can maintain that or they can uh, endure it. We do have some native flora that are also somewhat okay with that, um, like uh, bluets and spring beauties. As long as the a lawn or landscape isn't mowed excessively, um, they can actually do okay. And you can have a big burst of bluets and spring beauties in the springtime because they don't get very big. And uh, they're very used to being chomped down by deer. And so they really don't see much difference uh, in terms of whether they're being chomped by a deer or a lawnmower blade. Um, one of the best things to do if you're wanting to increase biodiversity is increase structural diversity. And so like, like oak savannas, like having good, good tall trees and uh, some shrubs and then uh, enough sunlight exposure for grasses and wildflowers, you know, that's a lot of structural diversity and that increases those biological niches or ecological niches. And so that the increase of that structural diversity and those niches also increases the amount of uh, potential wildlife you can have. Um, obviously, uh, you're not going to have rare stuff uh, if there's not rare stuff in the area. So, you know, you're probably going to, in an urban setting, you're probably going to have more of those generalist species, unless they're highly mobile, um, birds, birds and things like that. But uh, like uh, adding fruit trees, uh, native fruit trees like viburnums, things like that, uh, native bushes, um, things like that. Okay, thank you, Nate. Uh, and Val asks, where is the best place to find historic info on a piece of property? Oh. And Regina uh, adds that, you know, the historic aerial photos on Google Earth uh, on the PC or one source, but Nate, I'm sure you have some other sources that you can recommend as well. Here in Arkansas, you can look at... Um what's called a uh, public land office records. Uh, they're publicly available. They only go back to the, typically the 1800s. Um, but they'll often show plots of land and they'll show whether it was forest or pasture or somebody's uh, row crop field or things like that. Um, historic streams. Their accuracy is a little bit, a little bit, um, questionable at times, but, uh, and these were those land surveys, I believe that they did back in the 1800s when most of this was still, um, undisturbed, I suppose, or relatively right. speaking. Right. And like I said, these are, here's a link to these. <clears throat> that's what they look like. And these are usually kept in the, um, in the, uh, like the Congress library. I'm, I'm blanking on what it's called. <laughs> library. library of Congress. Of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes old USGS maps will have, um, I think they started noting the vegetation i mean i think starting in the 60s or 70s but um right. so it doesn't take you as far back as those old glo maps but um definitely uh, another potential source of information yeah un unfortunately back in the um 17 1800s you know no one was not many people were really just documenting you know, what plants existed in a in a certain location yeah, and if it was, it was mainly for timber resources um, and things that, you know, would have had economic uh, value at the time. Right, yeah. Most of the land, most of the, land in, uh, the earliest surveys in the United States were typically due to timber companies going out and surveying land for a potential timber harvest. And so a lot of times they would come across these oak savannas and they would call them barrens, B-A-R-R-E-N-S. And what that means is... The, to the timber surveyors who are looking for large timberable trees, these were barren. And because uh, they would see these you know, 200 year old post oaks that were moderate sized, surrounded by you know, 
grasses and wildflowers and milkweeds. That's not what they were, were looking for or valuing. They wanted the big trees. Yeah, a, lot like times on, a lot of times on the GLL notes, you'll see things referred to as barrens, and that's that's an indicator of an old savanna or possibly a glade or something like that. So definitely not barren, uh, more growing there than, say, a parking lot, which is, you know, what I'd call a barren nowadays. Right. <laughs> um, and then I think another source, uh, what was it? Oh, I had it in my mind. Uh, I forgot. But, I mean, I know you can go on and get um, – these old topo maps, you can even uh, download them as KMZs to pull up and Google Earth and it'll all be uh, placed in the correct location. It's kind of a, a fun thing to do because sometimes they will note areas as being prairie um, or, you know, something like that because there'll, there'll be a name to the prairie. And so it's interesting to kind of see where these prairies used to be that are now cities or pastures. But... Okay, moving yeah. on to... Moving on to another question here. Uh, Val also asked, is it true that about a third of prairie plant roots die and are replaced year yearly? That does sound right. I don't know for certain. But yeah, that's that's like what I was talking about with the uh, trillion trees um, concept. Like plants and uh, or, uh, grasses and wildflowers, they, they die off and their roots are you know, replenished, they're replaced. Um, they have a much shorter lifespan than, uh, than trees do, but they're constantly replenishing themselves through, uh, through what we call population recruitment. I would also recommend people read this uh, article called North America during the last 150,000 years. If they kind of want an idea of you know, how, how the climate in North America has, has shifted over 150,000 years through the ice ages, through many heat cycles, things like that. That's had a, a huge impact on, on climate and uh, biodiversity and things like that here in the United States. Um, let's put it in a context. At one point, the dominant tree species in Arkansas was actually the jack pine. Now that's the dominant tree species on the, the Canada-United States border. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing to think how much the climate has just changed. And I know in some of the Ozark, um, what do you call those um, lowly areas and um, they're not potholes, but we have a name for them. Like these uh, vernal pools, I think oh, I yeah. a name. Uh, they've, they've done a pollen analysis and have found pollen from like spruce and firs and stuff from when this was a much colder climate here and those right. trees that are jack now pine. up north are now okay a jack pine being one of those i guess yeah. um i just remember learning about the the firs and spruces that are now up north that used to be down here and so there's a, that evidence that they were here uh yeah and wanted to, go ahead after that uh there was a warming period where a lot of the eastern united states became almost desert-like and uh, hotter than hotter and drier than it is right now and uh, so we saw a real a massive explosion of uh, prairies and savannas and things like that, grasslands all across the southern United States. And it's only, geologically speaking, it's only relatively recently has the, has the you know, climate cooled, so to speak. And uh, we've seen the more ref reforestation or afforestation of the, of the southern United States. Yeah, that's, that's interesting stuff because, uh, you know, you think about, yeah, just changing climate and the disturbance that natural disturbance that occurs so is that the time period when the you know cacti like the prickly pear uh came into our part of arkansas or right. uh, okay interesting I, I wanted and, uh, to share, i'm sorry this, go ahead. that's not to, that's not to discredit the, the concept of global climate change at all but it, it's really the 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 time frame of that change occurs that can be really disruptive um, you know, natural global climate changes over the course of tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years. But when you have a, a sharp increase in the in the course of 100 years or 200 years, you know, that's that's a massive change in terms of of uh, that uh, ecological community has to respond to and doesn't really have time to adapt to. Right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, the slower the change, the better for sure species time to migrate and whatnot um there, there was i remember the other resource i wanted to let people know about and if you don't mind could i share my screen real quick so, and you might already know about this nate um 
But this is uh, on the web soil survey, and I learned about this from Ryan Diener with Quell, Quell Forever. Are you able to see um, my screen here with the map of the United States? Yeah. So if you go in, um, I just thought this was a cool tool for anyone that's looking to uh, use it for yeah, inspiration. So if we go in here and uh, just pick a place, you create an AOI, we'll just do something like this. Um, I don't know whose property this is, but uh, then I think you go to Soil Data Explorer, that tab, and then ecological sites. Oh. And you can click on this. And this is something new they've added within the last oh. couple of years or so. And you can look up like the type of ecological site it is and click this link down here and it'll take you to this other website. Um, and it even shows, tell, talks you about how to get it back to its reference site it has like a flow chart. If I can find that, Let's see. Oh, this is super cool. Dynamics. And then, yeah, come back here. So you have the reference site. Apparently, uh, the, you know, this area that I clicked on, uh, black oak, white oak, blueberry, sedge, little blue stem. So you have these arrows letting you know, like if you're at any of these other places, how to manage it to get it back. You know, like it, you know, you have like a process that you would need to go to to get it back to the reference site. So. Yeah. Um, down here, you know, it tells you the event or activity uh, for, you know, these, this transition. So, you know, if we found that we were at a fire managed oak pine woodland, you know, with these species, we want to get it back to this oak short leaf. So that way we can eventually work our way back to the reference site. And then we would need to, you know, uh, do this sort of event or activity. And so that's just a great tool for people that are wanting to manage their property to get it back to what it once was. Yeah, and that's what it looks like. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. So you would probably find that very useful, Nate, in your work. And other people oh, yeah. here might want to as well. Uh, somebody's wanting a link to the website. Uh, let's see. It's If you type in web soil survey, and this used to be all on um, in these books that, you know, they had a soil survey for each county. But now if you Google it, and I'll place the link here in the chat, um, you go to start WSS and then you got to create an area of interest. This is what this AOI means. So, um, and that's, you know, from there you can look up all kinds of information about the, the soils, like what soils uh, are mapped there. Soil Data Explorer is where you can look up the properties and whatnot. Uh, but that ecological um, tab here is uh, relatively new, is my understanding. And I just think it's awesome. And it's pretty accurate. I looked it up for my own property and they named exactly the species that I find grow really well there. So, all right, let's see. Any other questions um, back here or to the chat? How do I get? Oh, here we go. All right, going back up. Let's see. Uh, Susan Harden says, see you at the next uh, ANPS meeting. Uh, thanks you for an informative presentation with lots of new information uh, for her. Well organized also. Um, Dave, yeah, I posted the link. I posted the link. Uh, yeah, Tom really enjoyed uh, the presentation. Very interesting and informative. And yeah, Nate, uh, just to let everybody know, he is willing to answer any other questions. He's placed his email there in the chat, Nate, N-A-T-E, at beaverwatershedalliance.org. So if you have anything else for Nate, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to continue the conversation. Uh, just just be prepared. If you get them, get them rolling on it, you, know, you, you might get more than you bargain for because they're, you know, and that might be what you want. I know a lot of us would really like to hear Nate just go on and on about this stuff because uh, he's just such a wonderful a source of knowledge for all of us. Uh, oh, Chris Fisher asks, Nate, what is your take on the general health of the Beaver Watershed Basin in terms of disturbance management? This will be the last question before we'll wrap up. Oh. Well, uh, overall, I'd say the Beaver Watershed Basin, and the be uh, get into semantics, the Beaver Watershed Basin goes to Table Rock Dam. So when we say Beaver Watershed, we're just, in our case for the Alliance, we're specifically talking about everything upriver of, of Beaver Dam and Beaver Lake. Um, so I can't really speak about it much past Beaver Dam. 
But um, in terms of above Beaver Dam, um, one of our biggest challenge areas is obviously around the lake. We're seeing a lot of uh, you know development and land, rapid land use change um, in our town branch watershed uh, around Fayetteville and uh, some of the areas east of the the kind of urban area of Springdale, Rogers, Fayetteville. Uh, I'm seeing some low density housing developments going in and things like that and. Uh, uh, fortunately for us, less fortunate for our, for our you know, partners, the Illinois River watershed, but a lot of the expansion in our urban area is actually going west into the Illinois River watershed. But uh, despite that, you know, we still do see a lot of big developments going in, a lot of rapid land use change, uh, clearing and things like that. And that, that affects uh, stormwater runoff and things like that, erosion. So, but uh, despite that, uh, a lot of our watershed is still uh 70 something percent forest and 20 i think 23 percent pasture uh we're actually doing pretty well we're we're considered a model watershed so a lot of folks are looking looking at us and watching what we do and taking notes so that's a good feeling but we still have our problems and challenges yep. well thank you nate i really we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and passion with us uh at this webinar it was with some great information. Sounds like everybody else really enjoyed it as well. And thank you for the time uh, that you put into putting this program together for us. And also thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing at Beaver Watershed Alliance and as the president of the Native Plant Society. Uh, it's been a pleasure getting to work with you in those capacities uh, as well. Uh, thank you everyone also for being here with us today. Again, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, so please check that out. Uh, go ahead, give us a subscribe, uh, and that way you'll be notified when uh, new videos are uploaded to YouTube uh, for on the Arkansas Native Plant Society's YouTube channel. Again, our next webinar is going to be Saturday, October 22nd at 6 p.m. Justin Thomas, we're going to go real deep into uh, some philosophical sort of topics having to do with nature, and he's going to give a talk on Echesis, the Nature of Nature. You can find out more information about the Arkansas Native Plant Society on our website, anps.org, and I encourage you to join if you're not already a member. Uh, we have some uh, fall meeting coming up that will be in person uh, with a lot of hikes and presentations and whatnot. Uh, and it's going to be a real good time, and we're hoping to continue these in-person meetings um, into the future. So, again, Nate, thank you. We appreciate it, and good job. We uh, Some great information. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, everyone, who, who attended. Have a good day, everybody.